So they're uh, super famous. Uh, they have, um, you know, they've been involved in HCI for, for many, many years. Lots of really interesting stuff. They've recently got these uh, ERC advanced grants, which are sort of the European equivalent of the MacArthur uh, grant. Uh, they have a really well-funded lab. Uh, Michelle leads a big uh, Digiscope project. I think it's 22 million euros, uh, and uh, and they're uh, they're just always doing interesting things. Uh, Wendy and I used to joke that we looked at each other's what we've done to sort of see what we're going to be doing in the future. <laughs> you know, we've sort of followed a similar path of research interests. And, and I'll take no more time from that because it's much more interesting to do that than me. Okay, well, thank you, Jim. After that, I'm going to have to deliver. <laughs> okay, so as you saw, we gave a, a very, um, uh, a very, uh, uh, what would you call it? Uh, the title of the talk is kind of uh, pretty wild. Uh, so when he talks about uh, uh, unified theory of, of interaction, I'm, I'm only going for unified principles. So, uh, <laughs> and so yes, this is work that we've been doing uh, in our respective uh, uh, ERC grants, as you mentioned. And uh, so what I'm going to try to do is to uh, give you an overview of this uh, project, uh, but also of the sort of vision that we have behind uh, all of this stuff. So let me start um, uh, by introducing you to Nancy. So Nancy is a secretary in the mid-90s, uh, mid-70s, sorry, uh, and as you can see she's typing in a typewriter and she's writing memos for a boss and stuff like that. And the thing is, uh, it's important to remember that the graphical user interface was created for her. It was really for office work, for writing documents uh, I don't know why the thing is not that good here, but anyway, writing documents, uh, having files, folders, and all that. And that was back in 1981, the Xerox Star, we all know the story, and four years later, things have not changed a bit. We still struggle with documents, files, and folders. You're too old. Not everybody here knows the story. <laughs> yeah, but if I start telling the whole story, <laughs> I'm going to run out of time. But yeah, you, you're right. And I, not 40 years old. Yeah. And I notice with every, uh, every uh, new crop of students that come in, they, they know less and less about you know, the uh, stuff that is uh, before the web. The, there was a, a world before the well, web. But the way to put it, the Xerox star, nobody knew what to do with it, and therefore they made it to be for secretaries, and because men didn't type in those days. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, and therefore the, the thing failed. It failed for lots of reasons, but that was one of them. So there's lots of interesting stories around the, the how this GUIs came up to be, uh, but of course we all know that you know things have changed in that we don't use computers uh, only for uh, secretaries to write memos, uh, and we use them for many many different things. And in the history of uh, HCI research, we were promised a bunch of things. We were promised that you know we would uh, summon the computer with our you know hands, like uh, our friend uh, Tom here. Uh, we were told that you know, well, at least in sci-fi movies, that you know we would be augmented by uh, superpowers, so we could be like uh, Iron Man. And this is all nice and good, uh, but I think what's happening is this. Is, uh, this is from Wally, you know, and the people who have escaped to the Axon, the humans, and what they do, uh, they watch Facebook while sipping Coke all day. Um, and that's assuming that, you know, the computers have essentially taken over and they don't have to do anything anymore. Uh, and I think it's very sad because I think that you know computers were made to empower us, not to replace us or to make our lives more boring. So how do we fix that? Um, well, I think we have to rethink uh, the way we uh, think of interaction with computers and uh, uh, we want to have new a new approach. I would like to say, you know, if you could forget everything you know about computers and about how using computers, uh, why would you do to reinvent them from scratch? And that's very hard to ignore, you know, about all the stuff we use every day and think from, from scratch. Uh, today we use, you know, graphical interactions. I mean, GUIs are still dominant. Uh, everybody says, you know, they're dying, they're dying. No, they won't die. They're still, <laughs> they will be there forever. Um, we use touch, 
uh, a bit. I mean, you know, we put our fingers on the cold, flat slices of glass, and they call it touch. Uh, still very primitive, when you will tell more about this. We use vocal a bit. How, how many people here use regularly uh, Siri or something like this? Okay, it's growing a growing area, but uh, would you write your next grant with Siri? No, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, then, uh, you know, uh, virtual is finally emerging, maybe, I don't know. Uh, and we've been hearing about augmented uh, reality and tangible computing and embodied whatever. And all of these things are always claimed to be the next thing that's going to replace everything else, to replace everything else. And I don't think they will. I think all these styles of interaction will have to somehow live uh, together. And for me, the real question is, uh, what are we doing to make this interaction style uh, complement, coexist, and complement each other rather than trying to fight each other off the, the stage of uh, the next fashionable uh, interaction style? And I don't think there's enough work in that area. I think uh, uh, to work on this, we need to think at a more conceptual level, at uh, the level of the principles that make these uh, interaction styles different, similar, and uh, maybe uh, complementary. So what's wrong with current approaches, I think, is that we've built more and more, and we've heard a little bit about that in, in, in the talk earlier, uh, what uh, you know, people call walled gardens and information silos. Now, think of email. Email is a great thing because I can have an account on uh, Gmail and uh, I don't know if anybody still has an account on AOL, but uh, maybe on Outlook, uh, and we can still exchange email. So email is specified not by the applications that you use, but by your protocol. If your app talks to protocol, you can exchange email. But instead, you have the Facebooks and the Twitters and all the rest of uh, communication apps that have decided that they are going to have proprietary protocols, in a sense, so that you cannot write your own Facebook uh, uh, application. Twitter lets you do it for a while, and then they decide, ooh, it's too dangerous. Uh, or, I don't know, maybe they were losing money over it, I don't know. Uh, so, so you wouldn't do it. Uh, it's the same thing with the files. I have files on my computer and I have text files that I can open with a variety of uh, editors. Uh, even Word files, you know, uh, people have reverse engineered the format so I can open them in various editors. But then I put stuff on the cloud and then suddenly my Google Doc is trapped with uh, Google uh, and my iCloud document is trapped with iCloud. So even though the networking in that case should have liberated things, it had made things more siloed and harder and harder to access. Now, I think this lack of flexibility is really limiting what uh, everybody can do with, uh, with computers. We cannot appropriate those tools to uh, make them what we want them to be. And this is something that was mentioning, uh, that you were mentioning uh, earlier about these diagramming tools, for example. As Wendy likes to say, software is not soft. Uh, yes, it's all code, and yes, uh, you know, maybe it's even open source, and you can go hack it uh, if you want, but people don't. Now, I think there is uh, something ironic uh, historically here, is that if you look at the older interfaces, the one that were defeated by the GUIs, Unix, you know, and the command language, it was a lot more flexible. You could, with a bit of knowledge, uh, assemble various tools with pipes and make your own environment. Uh, but now with applications, uh, everything is trapped inside the application. And if I use uh, Excel or uh, Photoshop, I can only use the tools that have been given by Mr. Adobe or Mr. Microsoft. So how do we support interoperability and end-user appropriation? And I think that because we want more diversity, we in fact need more unification. It maybe sounds counterintuitive, but things that are more diverse can work together because they are built on, on, on single principles. And I think we need multiple apps to be able to access multiple types of content. So one app is not enough. We need our devices to be more free to communicate with each other. I still struggle to transfer you know, one thing from my uh, phone to my laptop. Uh, so one device is not enough. And of course, everything we do, we want to share as well. And so one user is not enough. And one morning I woke up and I had this vision that, in fact, one was the acronym for one is not enough. <laughs> and that gave me the title for my project, 
which I think is really the only reason why it was accepted, is because it had a cool title, <laughs> which is that, you know, one is not enough, unified principles of interaction. Okay, so now what are these uh, uh, principles going to be? Well, what we want is uh, to interact with content. So how do we interact in the physical world? Well, we interact through language, of course, a lot. Um, but we interact also, and I would say when it comes to making the built work around us, uh, with physical action. And so the interesting thing is that physical action is, uh, in general, uh, mediated by tools. We <coughs> do something with our bare hands, but humans in particular have been extremely good at developing tools uh, to operate, to manipulate the content around them, uh, building tools to build other tools. And if you look at this environment here, everything was made with tools. And I find the power of tools really fascinating. They can you know, be used for all sorts of things uh, as illustrated here. But fairly recently, in fact, there have been studies that have tried to look at the sort of a neurological basis for the uses of tools and the use of tools. And one of them that I find particularly telling is illustrated by the stick here. So when you look at the world in front of you, uh, you can tell if you can reach it, an object with your hand without trying to reach it. You, you, you know it, right? And it turns out some neurons you know, fire in your brain when they see the object uh, that is reachable and they don't fire if it's not reachable. Now, if I take a stick in my hand, suddenly an object that is further away that becomes reachable is going to make those neurons fire. What this means, another way to put it, is that we sort of internalize uh, tools as part extensions to our bodies. Uh, and recently I've come across the works of a French um, neuroscientist, Francois Ozurac, who's studying human tool use in very interesting ways and has a, a number of, uh, of theories about this. And uh, I think a way we could think about it uh, is that tools redefine the, in the affordances of the environment because it changed our capabilities and because affordances in the Gibson uh, sense of it are relationships. If I change my body, I change how I perceive the environment or the capabilities of the environment. And of course, you know, uh, an example I like to show is that if you put a, a kid in a room with a thing that writes, you will have stuff on your walls very soon. So uh, people are very good at appropriating things as tools uh, and at uh, creating uh, tools out of objects. And I think this is all possible because the physical world is extremely flexible. Hardware is not hard. <laughs> Take the, uh, so if I look at these pictures, you know, this is a pencil, this is a mug. Yes, of course, uh, because you've learned to recognize them as a pencil and a mug. But, you know, the pencil happens to be rigid and straight enough that you can use it as a ruler. And the mug, uh, if you don't drink coffee, can be a convenient paperweight. So we constantly appropriate the world around us because of the properties of the object. And this does not happen in software. This thing here, Word, was designed to write text, period. Uh, you cannot do things like this, which you can do with a pen and paper, and it's even harder to do this with Word. <laughs> now, of course, there is differences in, in, in existing software. Some software is more flexible than others. And a good example, of course, is uh, spreadsheets. Spreadsheets are you know, more powerful than anybody <laughs> who created them thought initially. And, and there keeps uh, creating interesting things with spreadsheets. These are three examples, uh, the Ninja Turtles in Excel, uh, some game at the bottom. And here, a visualization of um, some, uh, uh, some activity in New York, which actually comes from an Excel spreadsheet and has been turned into this, uh, uh, this animation. So people have been appropriating digital tools a lot, even though these tools uh, were not necessarily designed for, uh, for that in the first place. So this is why I think that we can bridge the gap between the physical and digital tools by uh, uh, taking inspiration from the physical world and, uh, and by building on unified principles. The reason that this is not just a pencil, but 
uh, it can be seen as a ruler, it can be seen as something to tie your hair, it can be seen as some, something to uh, uh, stick in a, in a device, is because it's made of atoms and molecules and material that has certain properties. Uh, it's wood, so it can burn. Um, it's an object, it's also a tool, it's also defined through its use, it's also, it can have also some cultural role, and we can look at an object at different levels of this, uh, at these different levels when we need to solve a particular problem. So that's what led me to, to introduce a while ago now, uh, in 2000, the notion of instrumental interaction, the notion that we should, in the digital world, have the same capabilities that we have in the physical world uh, to uh, use um, tools and instruments to mediate our activity with, um, with um, uh, digital objects. So in the same way as a pencil is a tool so you can make marks on paper, we have tools already in the digital world, like a scroll bar. It was a tool invented for the digital world. There's no scroll bar in the physical world. Uh, so it was invented in the, in the digital world so you could actually do something that was needed because documents were bigger than, than the screens or the windows to, to display them. And so this is very much against this widespread notion of uh, direct manipulation. Manipulation with tools is not direct, and that's what gives it power. It's indirect. Now, of course, the original reason for direct manipulation was to contrast with referring to objects through names and words. But uh, I think by having stuck to this, uh, to this uh, uh, denomination, maybe we've missed this, this uh, interaction and the power that we can have with tools. Now, many interfaces use uh, tools. I mean, you know, once, uh, once, you, once you have a nail, everything looks like a hammer. <laughs> uh, so, for example, you know, there's, I don't know if you know the paper application on iPad, which has uh, drawing tools and uh, a bunch of examples. I like the Wii example because this uh, uh, sensor, if you, you know, you can attach to it a, um, a, what, a, a steering wheel or something, and you turn it into uh, something that looks like the real object, and suddenly you, it, it enables you to, to feel more like you're engaged in the game. So, so instrument interfaces, in a sense, are already there, but can we push that idea uh, further? So when we uh, introduced the instrumental interaction, uh, we also wrote with Wendy an article on these three principles that help create uh, interfaces that uh, follow the, the, this idea. And the first one is reification. And one of our um, main examples for this that some of you uh, have seen, I'm sure, is the notion of magnetic guidelines. Uh, it's the idea that when you want to align objects in any graphical object, you typically have this kind of uh, dialog box here. Sometimes it's icons, sometimes it's words. Uh, but effectively, what you have to do, you select a bunch of things, then you click one of these, and then something happens. And for me, it's 50-50 if it's what I wanted or not. Um, and so we thought, okay, so what would be a tool to align things? Well, you know, in the physical world, you can take a ruler and push objects, and they get aligned. So we created these magnetic guidelines where essentially you can draw a line and then snap objects to it. It's magnetic. Uh, and then once they are on the line, you see they are aligned, and if you move the line, of course, everything moves with it as one would expect. Now, it took us 15 years to find a student who would want to push this idea further, but uh, uh, finally we, we did it a couple of years ago, and so I'm going to show you here a video uh, that illustrates a number of things once you push this idea. So here you can create a line, I snap objects to it, I move the line, all the objects moved with it. Uh, but what I can do is also distribute objects by uh, changing the setting here, and I can distribute them on their center, the left, the right. Uh, I can uh, create multiple guidelines, of course, and uh, they should combine uh, uh, properly. So here I can align horizontally and vertically these objects. And uh, I can also do the opposite, is grab the line and then grab objects as I move the line. Here I can also preview possible alignments, as some software does already, and then create them uh, uh, permanently, which current software does not do. So just, this video is really fast, I need to. So just with this simple idea, of just moving objects onto lines, away from lines, I can do way more than uh, any of the tools that are out there in the market uh, can do today. 
Now we pushed that a bit further because we worked with graphic designers and we showed that to them and they say, well, this is very cool, but I always have to tweak my alignments. I always have to make a, a slight adjustment. I mean, you know, there are graphic designers here. You know you have a logo. Uh, the center of the logo is never the visual center. So what we did is we reified the tweak and we said, oops, don't do that. <laughs> uh, that's really, yeah, I'll fast forward, sorry. So here we have this, I think, ah, what's happening? Bad tools. Yeah. You need sticky video. <laughs> I, I do, I do. Now how do I, I need to do this to start it? And then I have the slider here. Uh, where were we? Around here. Reified scrubbing. Yeah. Okay. So here I'm moving this object, and of course uh, it's not well aligned. So I'm using arrow keys, and it's creating this little purple thing, which is the tweak itself. Now the object is properly tweaked for my taste. I want to align this one, and in fact, because the tweak is reified, I can copy it, paste it there, and it will apply the same adjustment to that one. And I can do that not only, so of course, if I move the object, it remembers the, the tweak that was applied to it, and I can delete it. I can tweak the center of the object. I can also tweak the bounding box, because sometimes, especially when you distribute objects, it's not the center that counts, but it's the, the, the room they use, the space they use. So here, I can also reify the bounding box, copy, paste it. It's not in the right place, so I adjust it, and then I uh, finally... Um, move it. And as we will see here, if I set this uh, guideline to distribute objects, when I modify the bounding box of it, it will adjust the uh, distribution um, uh, properly. And finally, we played with more ideas, so we can uh, line things, oh, on circles, is that crazy or what? <laughs> uh, we can also take an existing object and align around that object by creating a, a sticky lines that will <coughs> be attached to the objects and, and follow it. Uh, we have non-horizontal or vertical lines, that's also pretty radical, pretty radical I would say. And uh, finally, we can change the distribution curve. Instead of having a linear distribution, I can have a, a more exponential distribution or sigmoid distribution to play with the way things are distributed. So the idea here is that by taking this simple idea of how I can create an alignment instrument, which turned out to be alignment and distribution instrument, I can create a bunch of capabilities that I didn't have before. Um, so, um, so the second principle we played with was polymorphism. The idea is that we want these tools to apply to multiple contexts. One good example we played with is the, is the uh, color picker. Every app has its own color picker. And why is it I cannot use the Photoshop one here in the middle to uh, inside of uh, Word, for example, uh, or why can't I use this device on the right which allows me to pick colors in the real world and, and apply them anywhere? Now, I won't be able to show you this uh, video, but we worked on this also with graphic designers, and uh, they uh, showed us all uh, interesting ways of manipulating color. And the fact, for example, that the color swatches they use are not really uh, what they need. And so here we have color swatches, but that can have any size and shape, so you can look at the contrast of colors in context. Uh, but in a sense, this becomes a document in itself. And in fact, many graphic designers leave the color swatches in their documents rather than uh, sort of so storing them separately. Uh, but then once you have these colors, you can apply them in different contexts. The last one is reuse, and that would be a whole story in itself. I won't uh, get into it today. Uh, the thing is, when we finished uh, playing with this notion of instruments, we realized that what was becoming important was what it is the instrument is, is interacting with. And that uh, uh, sort of brought this idea of an information substrate. And uh, we talked about web straits earlier. Uh, well, this weird name comes from a web substrate, a web information substrate. Now, a substrate is a word that's used in a number of disciplines in biology to describe the sort of uh, nourishing environment for the plant or in material science. What I mean by information substrate, what we mean by information substrate is the notion that information on paper, like the floor plan that's called what's showing, uh, has structure. Uh, 
So, you know, uh, uh, staff uh, for a musical score have a structure. The thing on the right, which is a painter's palette, also has a structure for the painter. I may not be able to understand it, but I'm sure for the painter it has meaning. And in digital world, we can, in fact, analyze some uh, existing uh, structures in, in that way as well. The spreadsheet and the power of the spreadsheet is that there's all these hidden dependencies between cells uh, that gives you a structure that you're actually able to build yourself. In Photoshop or other tools, you have these layers, uh, which is also this model of super, superimposing layers of, of information uh, to create more complex uh, things, including filtering and combining with different uh, rules, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's like instruments. Substrates are already out there in a sense, but can we really push the idea further so that we would be able to interact with substrates with uh, various types of instruments and not be constrained by the rules that the designers have put in their software? So the way we view substrates at the moment is that they have a structure. Uh, is it a list? Is it a graph? Is it a, uh, a tree or something? It has content that can be changing. Uh, it has internal rules that we call constraints. It has mapping rules, so a substrate can be mapped to another substrate. And it has external rules that we call relationships uh, that allows it to link to other content. For example, if you annotate something uh, or if you tag something, you are adding external uh, relationships to an existing substrate. And here we're getting to this notion of various layers of representation of something. If I have this graph at the top, it's pixels. Now, it's not the dead pixels that we were talking about before, uh, dead pixels on, uh, under, under the glass, because these pixels represent shapes. Those shapes themselves that represent some kind of graph. And this graph itself comes from some kind of data table. And the thing is, when I look at the pixels, I can look at just the pixels and want to smudge them with my finger, maybe. But I may want to look at the shapes, or at the graph, or at the data. And for each of these levels, I may have different tools. A painting tool, a coloring tool, a tool to change the type of graph, or a tool to modify the underlying table. Now, if we had all of these uh, uh, substrates existing in environments where we can combine them in different ways, then I would uh, really leverage the uh, power of tools that operate on each of, of these substrates. Now, of course, I want to make it so that if I move something here, it will maybe translate to the table down there or uh, things like this. So we have a, a, a video here of a same student actually who worked on the color portraits. Uh, did again working with graphic designers, where they um, wanted to see how they uh, create their layouts. And in traditional graphic design, <coughs> layout is the grid. Uh, but what they found is that, especially when they, dealed with, when they deal with uh, content that is um, uh, online, uh, the grid is not really the only uh, thing they use. And so they conducted a bunch of interviews and found a bunch of uh, what they call story portraits, capturing the different ways in which uh, the designers were uh, using uh, what they ended up calling graphical substrate to mentally capture the constraints they wanted to have in their designs. So this one is based on the number 42. Everything in the, in the layout is based on 42. The font sizes, the RGB yeah, colors, the <laughs> etc. So sometimes they do things that are uh, a little bit crazy uh, in terms of uh, imagining uh, rules that they set for themselves. But the software does not allow them to capture those rules. And they have to sort of reapply them by hand. And so I'm not going to have time to, to, to show them, but we created a, a different uh, software probes uh, to show graphic designers what it is we could do. Uh, and uh, they all rely on this notion that you reify, you, you externalize these constraints so they can manipulate them explicitly. So one of them was to express constraints so that the document would look different if you look at it during the day, during the night, or depending on different uh, uh, contextual values. Another one allowed you to set relationships between uh, various elements in the layout based uh, on their size. So uh, you, you create one layout for an article, but depending on the length of the title, the layout is going to be adjusted uh, to be a little bit more lively and different. So, um, 
and I need to uh, wrap up quickly because uh, <laughs> Wendy is getting impatient. Uh, so the last thing I want to talk about is universal sharing because I talked about multiple users. And the reason, uh, in fact, uh, we ended up building this uh, tool called WebStraits is because we wanted to have the notion of really sharing things in real time. Not Facebook sharing where you send you know, copies of pictures around and then you lose control over them. Real, real sharing. And so that's the uh, WebStraits video that I'm not going to show uh, entirely. But the idea was to take the web content, the DOM, and say, well, we share this in real time. Now, playing with the CSS, I can have different uh, uh, ways of displaying the same document in, in one column or two columns, for example. Here, someone is sketching a, a picture on the tablet. It's showing up in the paper and on someone else's screen. Someone else's screen is using a different tools to turn that into an SVG uh, uh, document. It synchronizes uh, in real time with the other uh, content as well. And then later on in the video, I will let you uh, uh, watch it. Uh, we turn the well. Here, it's a tool that we create to uh, uh, add the citations to um, to a document. Uh, but then we show that this tool, we can take it and give it to someone else. We can use it in a uh, um, in a slideshow application, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's again this idea that with very simple. I think unifying principles or s simple basic principles, then we get a lot of power if you just uh, try to push them a little bit. So I'm going to close here. The last part is about interactive environments. Uh, Jim mentioned the Digiscope project where we have created 10 interactive rooms on the Paris uh, Saclay campus. And we have been developing uh, various uh, pieces of software to here. Um, this is actually pretty old where we are uh, working with a neuroanatomist who display uh, a whole database of, of brains. They're all different brains. They're very similar, but they are different. Uh, and uh, now that we have this environment, we've been playing with, I'll show this uh, one video here. Uh, we've been playing with uh, collaboration, of course, co-located collaboration, but also remote collaboration across our different wall size display. And uh, this is actually using web straits running on the wall display here. And, uh, and what we found is that we, we can actually uh, uh, have this notion of instruments and substrates generalized to this multi-surface environments and uh, multi-user uh, context. So that's uh, the one project, substrates, instruments, environments. And if you're interested in uh, knowing more and uh, coming to Paris, apparently it's not a bad experience, uh, <laughs> we'll be happy to have you. Thank you. So we always have a tough time when we're both talking because we both have a lot of overlaps in some of the things that we talk about. So um, I have tried to keep mine different from yours. Um, so, okay. Um, I'm going to talk about, in terms of these unified principles of interaction, um, Michelle's been talking about how would you build a system? How would you make it, you know, so that actual human beings like us would not be driven crazy by all of these separate siloed applications that we all deal with? And that comes to instrumental interaction and substrates. There's another issue, which is, OK, now that we've built these things, how do we design them so that we can interact with them over time? And this is what I call co-adaptive systems, which basically involves how human beings both learn about systems and appropriate them over time. And this leads to what we call human-computer partnerships. So that's what I will talk about. Now, just very, very quickly, if you think about how you interact with a computer, you can do it one of three ways. You can think of the computer as a tool, as Michelle was talking about, and we use tools that empower people. So Iron Man has been empowered by his wonderful suit. Um, you can also do the servant model. You gave a kind of pejorative example from Wall-E of, um, you know, the computer does everything for us and we don't have to do anything. But of course, there are clearly very useful things that computers as servants can do. And finally, the computer is a medium. And if you look at social media and the incredible success of that, the computer as a medium for human beings to communicate with other human beings is also extremely important. Okay. So when we take a machine learning perspective, which I don't usually, but sometimes, um, they talk about what they call the human in the loop. And generally, that translates. It took me a while because I was like, well, that's good. You know, humans in the loop, great. That seems sort of right. But what happens is researchers think of human beings as input. 
The real thing is to make a better algorithm. And if you look at the research in machine learning, it's all about, I've got a better algorithm. And there's an assumption that, of course, that's going to be better for the human hand wave, hand wave. So there's another issue. OK, and so I should just say, there's, there are examples where we all use Google, I assume. Um, you know, we type something. It's got incredible machine learning algorithms, some of the best on the planet, in terms of um, trying to figure out what you're trying to say and then give you feedback back. So there are useful uses of this. But they don't all work well. And so what I want to do is think about how we move from human in the loop to also consider what I would call computer in the loop. And here, the idea is, OK, how does your computer algorithm help me as a user do better what I want to do? All right. So another way of saying that is that from a computer science point of view, we already create lots of models of users to inform the system. So now we have really smart systems. Artificial intelligence, great. But we should also create models of the system to inform users so that we as human beings have some clue about what's going on in the computer. And that knowledge has to be used so that we can both do more stuff that we want to do and also decide when not to do it. And I'm sure you've been following the news lately with what's happening with Facebook and elections and so on. And there's a lot of uninformed consent out there because <coughs> users are basically treated as, you know, they will just click yes because they want the free software. So the challenge here for us as research is how do we create human computer partnerships? How do we do something where it makes sense on both sides? Not that one is better than the other, but we have to do both. Now, when I talk about partnership, there's lots of different definitions of this. So let me give you a kind of lightweight summary here. Imagine that it's Friday night and you've been drinking with your buddies, I'm talking to the students here, right? We never do that. Um, and you've been drinking a little too much and you will need to take a cab to get home, all right? What you're doing is you're abdicating control. You're saying, here's the address, you figure it out and just take me home. So delegate, delegate, delegate. Fine, the driver's in control. Now, if you're driving a motorcycle, that is a highly skilled activity. You have to get a license, you have to learn, you get better over time, but it's a lot of fun, right? And so you can be in a partnership with that machine in which you, the user, feel very much in control, okay? But you shouldn't do that on that Friday night. That's not a good time to do it. Now, a third option, and this is kind of the vision statement here. You were talking about vision statements earlier. Third option is why can't we be a little bit more like riding a horse? So the horse knows you're drunk and says, OK, I'm going to get you home and not going to gallop. Or the horse is like, hey, you know, let's go out and go. And you and the horse know something about each other. And it goes back and forth. That's the kind of relationship that would be nice to have. That's what I would like in a human computer partnership. We are not there yet. But it's a vision. We could do that. All right, so I will argue very briefly that there are three components, at least, um, that you need to be able to share control with the computer. You need some sense of discoverability, and I'm talking from the user's perspective here. The user has to be able to discover how it works. And if we think about affordances as an example, um, you were talking about Example, with the physical world, we have a lot of knowledge about how the physical world actually works and how we can do things with it. Computer systems are not as discoverable, and we need to figure out ways of letting people discover them. Appropriability, that means we need to be able to take that pencil and turn it into a ruler or a straight edge, or I can use it as a ruler and measure you know, things, or I can break it and you know, poke somebody with it. There's all kinds of things we can do. And then there's another one, expressivity, which I'll get to. Hey, Wendy? Yeah? The interface that I think of today that comes closest to the person riding the horse yeah. would actually be Google search. Yes. Where I actually it, think you're yeah. right. I think it's, it's, it looks deceptively simple, yeah. but it's extraordinarily good at that because it does know something about me, and I know what I'm looking for, and it proposes things, and it's actually one of the best examples. I think you're absolutely right, um, and that's why I say I don't want to come off as sounding like, oh, machine learning's bad, blah, blah, blah. Um, there are times when it, when it works. Um, it's focused on a particular 
thing, but and you but can it's take an issue. Tight range if you want to yes, also, like that's right. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, let's um, go and see. So the question is, let me just do a little side. I tried I shorten this bit, but I'll do a little side bit on physical tools because I, I really like this image. I don't know how well you can see it, but this is a cutting board. This is an iPad. This is a photograph of a cutting board. This is a guy cutting on the iPad. Hmm. So is that it? I mean, it's actually a delightfully nice surface for, as an actual physical cutting board. And maybe it's showing him what he should do, and I don't know. Anyway, so we can play games with this. Um, we all have the, you know, if you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So here we have that. We also have the, if you have a nail, everything looks like a hammer. Um, the thing is that we want to be able to improvise in these kinds of ways. And there isn't sort of a, a necessary definition of what a tool is or the object of interest. That is that what Gibson would tell us um, from the affordances concept is that it's relative. All right, now, beyond Google search, I want my computers to let me do this, right? I want it to be worthwhile learning them. I don't want to have it so that every time I learn be skilled in Photoshop or Illustrator or whatever, I get an upgrade that de-skills me that takes away things that I've already learned. I want to be able to take things that I learn in one context and apply it to another, as Michelle was talking about, across applications. Um, he does not have to deal with Microsoft telling him that the G string is really you know, an A string this week. right? And he can feel that instrument, and he can interact with it. It's talking to him. There's a very tight, he's, it's like the, the relationship between um, him and the violin is closer to him and the horse than anything else, right? Now, what is nice about musical instruments as instruments, they're, they're very sophisticated tools, is that what we want is to be able to have something that's incrementally learnable. I want to be able to start here as a novice and then go progressively through. And if I really want to invest a lot of time, I can be Lang Lang. Well, maybe I can't, um, but some people can. But I can do something simple. So that's the goal. You want to be able to not have to relearn everything. You want to have skills that persist and develop over time um, with computer tools, not just physical tools. Now, I'm going to now talk about phones. All right, this is a wonderful piece of technology. It's an amazing piece of technology. So is this. Well, it's not technology. This is biological, right? So this has a computer that um, they would have killed for when they were trying to put people on the moon. It's an amazing computer. Um, it has a very, very sophisticated camera, sensing, all kinds of things going on. My hand, incredibly sensitive. I can do all kinds of things. And so what do I have here? Is I have, in terms of interaction, the ability to tap, drag, swipe, and pinch. And that is, so we've, we've basically created this bottleneck. And there's this tiny little bit of stuff that we can do to get all this power back to us. Now, the phone does not look like this. These tools, these are specific tools, but these tools are designed and, and appropriated and used to learn. People learn these things um, over time. So I'm going to have to go faster. So we have a fundamental trade-off. We have power of expression, which is really important, but it requires you to learn something. And we have, um, excuse me, we ha yes, right, and the simplicity of execution. So what we want is to balance these two. And I would argue that there's usually a trade-off. So in software tools, you often have very powerful tools like Photoshop, but they take a lot of learning, right? And then you have very simple tools, but they don't do very much. And so the question is, as researchers, what do we want to do? Well, ideally, we want to shift the curve. And I would argue that the techniques that Michelle was talking about, reification, polymorphism, reuse, this notion of substrates, allows us to shift that curve. We get tremendous power while maintaining simplicity. All right, now, I'm going to show you, I'm going to skip over, yeah, I'm going to just jump through this. All right, discoverability. So I'm going to give you some examples of things that we can play with in terms of discoverability. So what if I want to do something more complex to get more power out of my phone? Well, I can use gestures. That's nice. But how do I learn gestures? So this is something that is actually getting pretty old. It's 10 years old now, um, almost. Um, this is something, it's showing every day. but it's, it's, it's a nice one, yeah. So this is what we call 
Octopocus is a dynamic guide and it gives you progressive feed, feed forward. So imagine that I'm here, I put my finger down and the cut command is this one, the copy command is, command is this one, and the paste command is that one. As I start moving, this disappears, this blue one disappears, and the other ones remain. This one is thicker because that's more likely, so I'm getting information about how the system is interpreting it. But here, I could still do this. If I forget, this is really useful, I get this back. All right, so now what happens here is we have, this is built on this very clever idea that Gord Kurtenbach had with marking menus, which is if you pause, it's an indicator that you don't quite know what you want to do, so you get the information in context. But if you're an expert, just do it. So here, if you're an expert, you just do the copy command or the cut command. But if you pause, then you get this extra right. help. The next one is how can I define my own gestures? So what we have is we can show you what the gestures are that are already there. We built something called command board, which we just um, did in WIST 17. It's a new one. Are you familiar with gesture typing, right? Where you draw from letter to letter to create the words. And here what we do is we can take any word, not just to put in a word, but now there's a command space and it identifies the command space. So I can do um, a word here. I start typing Alice. Um, they want to go talk to Alice Brook instead of Alex uh, Waltz. And so we draw Alice, go up, and then it gives me this Octopocus style menu. And I can email her, I can use WhatsApp, I can call her, I can do SMS. So I start writing the person's name and then I magically get all the different possibilities I can do. Now what we've done here, everything that's in black and white is what exists already. You can tap these things or you can draw. But now what we've got is a command bar, which is like a word suggestion bar, but this is specific to what's already there. And we have the ability to learn what's available, and also to execute it in a very short way. Anyway, um, another thing that I can do is I can write any command here, like um, uh, airplane mode, say. I needed to do airplane mode. I start writing airplane, it says, oh, that's right. I go up here and I just do an execute. So there's one command, which is up and down, and that says execute. So there's the, I know it is. So imagine now what you've got is a full command line interface, like as in Unix, but from your gesture keyboard. And you have all of the scaffolding that you get in terms of discoverability, but you get the very fast version for the experts. Yes? How would you select which gestures corresponded with, with which of these options? Well, that gets me to my next thing. All right, um, so discoverability, appropriability, how do I find it? So um, <clears throat> here what we have is this is more about the feed forward, but about how the system is recognizing your gestures. So here, you want to create your own gesture commands. So say I want to have call mom, you know, call mom here on my, uh, on my phone, and I want to decide what that looks like, right? So I have two problems. I want a gesture that is easy for me to remember, and I want a gesture that's easy for the system to recognize and distinguish from everything else, right? So what I want is two kinds of feedback. I want to here, what we do is somebody starts drawing a circle, and if you stop in the red, it's being recognized. So it's revealing that there's a circle gesture, which is one interesting piece of information, because maybe you didn't know that. But also, you're going to have to do something else. So here, this person, this is actually very common, just keeps going. And that's a little purple, so if I go there, it's blue. And if it's blue, you're fine. It will be uniquely identified. This is very robust, and it works very well. And I won't be able to show you the video, so it's going to break my heart. But that's basically the idea, is that we have this way of revealing what the system is doing to the user as they perform the gesture. And they get this balance of what's, they know what's good for them in terms of easy to remember. And the system knows what it can recognize uniquely. So, all right, last one. I will stop here. So. When you do text messaging like this, I just grabbed this out of a link with Michelle. Um, I can probably tell it's Michelle because, you know, well, it says Michelle, but you see, I didn't <laughs> see that. Um, but there's nothing in the way it's written that makes me think it's Michelle. Now, look at this. We get a huge amount of information. This is very expressive. This is a kid. This was not the same person who wrote this. 
this person had a strategy for doing <coughs> I, 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 will, 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 be, 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 be thankful. And then it looked like the strategy changed around eight. Um, and was a little bored on the side, you know, and so on. We have all of this extra expressive power, which is just thrown away. All right, so last one. Back to our expressive keyboard. We actually have a tremendous amount of information that's individual um, by the user. So this is the word great. And clever, clever Google will figure out every one of these translates into a correct spelling of great. It's a very powerful algorithm. They've got a dictionary and a machine learning algorithm. They play that out, works great. Yes, I know, and I'm, I, it's, yes, uh, we've worked with Schumann, Schumann uh, Shai on this, and uh, he's actively, yes, I, good point. He's now at Google, but he was at IBM when he did this. Anyway, um, so the argument that we have here is what the original shark system and, and all of this did is it, you'd go and do your thing here. You have this wonderful rich gesture. It throws all of this away, and it just gives you the word. What we do is we look at that same gesture. We just take advantage of that. We don't redo that. But we take advantage of all this rich gesture, and we do a feature analysis, which does mapping to things like color. Color is very interesting because we can control it very precisely. So it turns out, for example, if you tell people that a curvy gesture is more green, and a gesture that changes the speed will give you red, and a gesture that's bigger versus smaller is going to give you blue. Then you have R, G, and B. And people combine them to make all of the colors that are available. What's interesting is if you tell them that, they don't do nearly as well as if you say, yeah, play with it until it looks green. And then they learn how to do it. So there's this tight thing with the motor coordination right. and so on. Um, we're working with a professional typographer right now um, and the idea, and looking at different kinds of mappings, and the idea is that we can create expressive typography under the user's control. If you're talking to your boss, maybe you just want vanilla stuff. But you might want to play with this. Um, we've done tests where you're walking versus sitting, and this is kind of uh, starts getting very amusing, or you're on the bus, and you can tell that, you know, I can tell Michelle's traveling, he's on the bus, and so on and so forth. So the idea is that. Party night after drinks. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Back to our tone. So um, basically, we have this issue of how do we turn something as simple as this into something that uses these principles that allow users to understand more about what's going on, control it better, have access to significantly greater power, and be expressive with it. And so basically, this is where we are. We've got these. Unified principles of interaction, which we've been working on for a number of years now, which allow us to build systems and think about things from a different way. I was delighted when you were talking about how web straits makes you think in a different way. That's kind of our goal in all of this. And we find that if we teach our students about reification, in particular polymorphism and reuse, they start coming up with really innovative things rather than lots of buttons, right? Um, and then we want to think about how you have systems that can grow with you and um, empower people over time. So I will stop there, and I apologize for my videos. I'm heartbroken. Anyway. <laughs>